Well, good morning, everyone. If you would please take out a Bible and turn with me to the book of John. We're going to begin our lesson in the book of John in chapter 10 with something that Jesus said, beginning in verse 11. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me. I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. An incredibly powerful passage here from Jesus. An incredibly powerful message. And I am going to blow it out of context like I might not have ever done before, and I just want you to know that going into this. Jesus is teaching a very powerful point here. But in teaching that powerful point, what he does is he talks about a shepherd, a good shepherd, and on the other hand, he talks about a hired hand. And we see that The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He puts his life on the line. And Jesus is saying of himself, I put my life on the line for my sheep. But then he talks about a hired hand. Somebody who is paid to do the job of shepherding. Someone who does not own the sheep. And the hired hand, when a wolf comes, what does he do? He leaves the sheep. He flees and he runs away. Now, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees here, and this is a condemnation to them. But the question is, what is the difference between a good shepherd and a hired hand? What is the difference between a good shepherd and someone who is paid to do the work of shepherding? The difference, as we'll see from this story and throughout this lesson, the difference is commitment. The difference is investment. The difference is in loyalty and purpose. That is the difference. The good shepherd is committed. The good shepherd is invested. The good shepherd loves and cares about those sheep and has a sense of purpose about why he's doing what he's doing. The hired hand has none of that. And I think as somebody who preaches regularly, as somebody who teaches Bible classes of our little ones, as somebody who studies with other people, I have questions a lot of times that have to do with how do I get people to have a sense of investment, to have a sense of commitment? Because I can't tell you how many times I've sat across the table with somebody, how many times I've sat in a Bible class, how many times I've walked away from a lesson and thought to myself, that's probably not going to do any good. That's probably not going to change people. That's probably not going to make them committed to the things that we talked about. And maybe you're in that same boat. Maybe you ask those same kinds of questions. And we often ask questions like, how do I present the gospel to the lost and dying world around me in a way that will make sense to them, in a way that will convict them and help them to commit themselves to Jesus? How do I look around at my brothers and sisters in Christ who decide not to attend services, who don't seem to care anything about being here whenever the doors are open? How do I instill in them a sense of investment or loyalty or commitment to being here and worshiping with the saints? Another question. How do I help transform other people's lives into being more like Christ? All of these questions at their core really center on the idea of investment and loyalty and commitment. How do I turn someone from a hired hand who's merely just doing it for pay into somebody who is invested in the process of spiritual growth and development? How do I do that? And the answer is very simple and something we're going to talk about this morning. The answer to that question is we have to start by telling them why they should care in the first place. 
we have to start by telling people why they should care about these things in the very beginning of it all. Because as you go back to the story of the shepherd, the shepherd knew why he was standing out there feeding those sheep, caring for those sheep, and protecting those sheep. Why? Because he loved them, and he cared about them, and he owned them. And as Jesus talks about earlier in the book of John, he knows them by name. He has a relationship with them. He's invested. But when you have no skin in the game, when you have no stake in what's going on, when you have no commitment, no loyalty, or no investment, then of course, words like, you need to be a Christian, are going to fall on deaf ears. Of course, words like, you need to be here when the doors are open, are going to fall on deaf ears. Of course, words like, you need to become more like Jesus in your life, are going to fall on deaf ears. And so we're going to talk this morning about becoming a church that is built on purpose. Becoming a church that is built on purpose. Becoming a church that focuses on growing investment, growing loyalty and commitment among the membership. We need to be the kind of people who are focused on our purpose and know what that purpose is and are able to communicate that purpose to other people. Then and only then will, be, will we be like the shepherd who has skin in the game and who's invested and committed and loyal. But here's what happens. Oftentimes, and on the board I've put this series of, of circles, oftentimes we start with the what. Everybody knows what we do. Everybody knows what this church is about. Everybody knows what we do. We know when our, when our services start. We know where our spot is to sit. We, we know all of these things, right? On the surface, that's obvious. We know what. Some people know how we do what we do. Some people know the reasons why or how we do the various acts of worship that we do, how we in involve ourselves in various activities outside of this church. Some people know how, but very few people know why. Very few people have a solid foundation on the why behind the whole thing. And here's the problem. And this is the problem of the hired hand. We often start with what and how. And I am as guilty of this as anyone. I can what and how you all day long. I can what and how you until the cows come home. I can give you a five-point sermon on how to be better at this, a six-point sermon on how to do that. I can give you these four steps to becoming a better fill-in-the-blank. We what and how people all day long. It's not to say that the what and how are unimportant. And I want you to understand that. That is not at all what I am saying today. I am not at all saying the what and how are unimportant. Because the what and the how of the hired hand was to stand there, feed the sheep, and, oh, by the way, protect them. The what and the how are critical. But when we start with the what and the how, without understanding why, then when trial comes, when difficulty comes, we're going to run away. And you can go to the parable of the soils that Jesus talks about to find out more information about that. But it leaves people unconvicted, unconvinced, unchanged. Maybe they'll serve the Lord for a while, but they really won't stick to it. They won't have any root. They won't have any heart behind it. They won't have that sense of investment, that sense of loyalty or commitment. But we need to start with the why. We need to start with the why. And the shepherd was only out there with the sheep because of the why. The good shepherd understood that he owned the sheep. He was invested in the sheep. He loved the sheep. He cared about them. And when he started with the why, moving out from that, the how and the what fell out of that process, fell out of that belief and understanding. When we start with the why, when we start with the purpose of why we're even doing what we're doing, then... We will convict people and change people. Then we will help people to be committed to the cause. And then 
We will help people to become rooted in the purpose that God wants us to be about. We have to start with the why. And then from that, we need to focus on the how and the what. And let me give you a few examples on those questions that we asked earlier in the lesson. I want to look at three examples this morning, just very briefly. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail about each of these because we just don't have time. But Acts chapter 2 on the topic of evangelism. How do I get somebody to hear the gospel and to obey? Here is what we often do and start with the what. Here is what we do. We say, you need to be saved from your sins. And we go to Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 where he says, you will receive the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. We go there and we start there and we sit across the table from somebody and we say, you need to be forgiven of your sins. Well, how do you do that? Well, we all know the answer to that. Repent and be baptized. You might even go a step further. You might even throw the entire list at them. Hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. And when that is the message that you present to people in that way, that seems very hollow, doesn't it? That doesn't have a lot of depth to it, does it? And then when somebody asks why, almost as an afterthought, almost as something that we, it should just be obvious, it should be a foregone conclusion, why? We say, well, obviously God is amazing. That is not a convicting message. And I know that because that is not the way that it was preached. That is not the way that it was preached. Peter didn't stand up there and start with, you all need to be forgiven of your sins, and I'll tell you how to do that. What did Peter do? You know, his message, beginning in verse 19, or verse 22, his message, by the way, did not even contain a single what or how. Have you ever noticed that? In Peter's message, the very first gospel sermon, didn't even contain a single what or how. Now, I'm somebody who likes the practical applications, and I think we all do. I think we all appreciate practical applications, right? The, the, the word is used twice up on our goals board, practical. We like practical. Tell me the how. Tell me how to do it. Show me how to do it. Give me the practical thing. You know what Peter doesn't do here at all? Give him a single practical application. What does he do? Where does he start? He starts with the why. He starts with the why by saying that Jesus is amazing. Jesus is amazing. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in our midst as you yourselves know. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. He is amazing. He did signs and wonders and miracles. He is amazing. God raised him from the dead. Prophecy announced his coming. He was exalted to glory at the right hand of God. He is Lord. That's not just a throwaway word. He's the king. He's in command. And you killed him. There's not a single what or how in that. And what happened? Verse 37. Now, when they heard these words, they were cut to the heart. They were cut to the heart. They were pierced to the heart. It affected them in their heart. This wasn't a purely mental exercise. This led to an emotional reaction. We are cut to the heart. We are pierced to the heart. And then they have to ask him, what shall we do? What shall we do? They asked him the what and the how. And the what and the how are the same. Repent and be baptized and that will save you from your sins. But he didn't start with the what and the how. He started with the why. And when that sank in, when that really started to pierce their heart, naturally they said, what do we do? And Peter could have said anything to them. And they would have done it. Peter could have given them any command for any purpose, and they could have done it. He 
says, repent and be baptized and wash away your sins. That is the message that was preached. Not starting with what and how, but starting with why. Let's go on to the second example. Oh, we like to talk about attendance and we know where we're going. A couple times a year, we look at a lot of charts and graphs. And I'm not saying charts and graphs are bad, by the way, because my dad's the one who puts them together. Just so we're all clear, I know he's going to be watching this later. Charts and graphs are fine, but let me tell you something. Charts and graphs are never going to convince somebody to attend. They're not. And I think we all know that. And I don't think that's the purpose of looking at charts and graphs about attendance. That's not. But we go and we start oftentimes with the what. We say, well, you need to love and encourage one another in verse 25 of Hebrews chapter 10. Encouraging one another. All the more as you see the day drawing near. That's what we need to be doing. We need to be loving and encouraging one another. Well, how do we do that? Well, you've got to not forsake the assembly. You've got to be here. I realize I'm preaching this kind of the, to the proverbial choir at the 9 a.m. service, given the fact that all the charts and graphs show that half the people are going to show up for the next lesson. Maybe you can share this message with them. But understand that when we tell people that you need to love and encourage others and that you need to not forsake the assembly, naturally it's going to lead to why. We say, well, as almost an afterthought, obviously God is important and his family is important. But that's kind of a hollow message, isn't it? Doesn't that sound like a hollow message to you? But let me say, that's not how the Hebrew writer taught this lesson. That's not where he started. He didn't start with the how. He didn't, he didn't start with the what. He started with the why. And the why is in verse 19. That we have access to God confidently in the holy places by the blood of Jesus. It was Jesus' death on the cross. It was his blood shed for you that gives you access to God with confidence. He opened up a new way by his death, verse 20. He is our great high priest. He goes before us to God. He communicates to God on our behalf because he's our high priest and he loves us and he cares about us. He wants a relationship with us in verse 22. He wants to be near to us. We need to draw near to him. And he wants to be near to us. Verse 23 says that he is faithful to us. When you let this sink into your heart, how amazing God is. How amazing the death of his son is. All the work he's doing on your behalf before God how he's faithful to us. He wants a relationship to us. If you just let that fact percolate for a little while in your heart, what is that going to make you want to do? Well, it's going to make you not want to forsake the assembly. And it's going to make you want to be the kind of person who loves and encourages other people. The why drives the how and drives the what. When we don't present the why, we are presenting a hollow message to people. And that's never what it's been about. Let's look at the third example, living like Christ. We just got done a little while ago studying the book of Ephesians, so hopefully this will be fresh on your mind. Book of Ephesians, probably around chapter 4 through chapter 6, the last half of Ephesians really does focus on some very important ways to live like Christ. Live like a Christian, chapter 4, verse 6, or 4 through 6, and we'll, we'll go on and we'll list all the things here. How do you do that? Well, we need to speak truth to each other. We need to be united. We need to become a new man. We need to avoid anger. We need to love each other. We need to be a good citizen, a good parent, a good child, a good husband, a good wife. We need to study our Bibles. There's a whole lot of what's and how's in the end of Ephesians. And then you stop and ask, well, why? Well, obviously our way of life matters. And that seems kind of like an afterthought. It seems kind of hollow at that point. But that, again, is not how it was preached. Because if you miss the entire first three chapters of the book of Ephesians, you've missed it all. 
That is exactly what Paul is doing. He's starting with the why, and then the first three chapters of the book of Ephesians, the whole point, the entire message of the first three chapters is to say, and this is an eye chart, I, get, I grant you that, but hopefully you remember all of these things, that all spiritual blessings are in Christ. That he was chosen before, that we are chosen before the creation of the world. We're adopted as sons. We're brought to life by his mercy. We're seated with Christ. We're reconciled to God. We're citizens and family together. God dwells with us. And we have bold access to God through his death. And he strengthened, strengthens us through his spirit. And then at the very end, what does he say? All the things you can imagine about what God can do, he can do far more than anything you can ask or imagine. Far more than anything you can comprehend. God can do it. Let the first three chapters sink in. And then naturally, the how and the what fall out of that. Because of who God is, because of what he's done for you, because of all the love he's shown you and his power and his glory and his amazing nature, well, shouldn't it make sense that I treat my wife with love and respect? Shouldn't it make sense that I am a good citizen, that I'm a good employee? Shouldn't it make sense that I study my Bible? Of course. And so I hope you can see from these three examples that all throughout the Bible, the what's and the how's that we typically go to to answer these questions, we miss the why. And unless we start with the why, it's all fruitless. And so hopefully we're tracking, hopefully we're on board here with the why being necessary first. So let me get to the real point of this lesson. We need to be a church built on purpose. We need to be a church that is established by our mutual agreement about the why. We need to be a group of people who all know why we do what we do. We focus so much on the what and the how. The what and the how are important. But until and unless we all agree on the why, then it's no wonder why people are unconvinced. It's no wonder why people are not loyal when they fall away. And we'll talk about that more later in the next lesson. The real question here is, how can we get people in the church? How can we become the church that God wants us to be? How can we get our membership, each and every one of our members, fully invested, fully committed to what we're doing here in the work at Monte Vista? How can we do that? That is one of my primary thoughts anytime I get up here and preach. And I hope it's your primary thought, too. How can we get people invested in what we're doing? Well, be with me in the book of Philippians, then, please. Book of Philippians, chapters 1 and 2. We're going to look at the why that we need to start with. Notice here in the book of Philippians in chapter 1, Paul's entire message, really, in the beginning is to say, why he's writing to the Philippian church in the first place, and his motivation for writing is because he feels a sense of partnership with them in the gospel, verse 5. Verse 7, he holds them in his heart. Verse 9, he wants their love to abound. He wants, in verse 12, to advance the gospel. And in verse 18, he talks about rejoicing. Paul's main motivation for writing is because he loves and he cares and he is deeply connected to them. Think about the good shepherd, the one who's invested. Paul is invested in the church at Philippi. And then he tells them what they need to think about, what they need to set as their purpose before they start following all the hows and all the whats that he's going to give them later on. Here's the purpose. Let's begin reading in verse 1 of chapter 2. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. If you could boil down the purpose of this church into two verses, the purpose of Monte Vista into two verses, this should be it. 
this should be it. This is why we do what we do. This is why we care so much about other people. Because Christ brings us encouragement. Christ is encouraging to us. He builds us up. He wants to see our good. And how does he do that? Well, he comforts us in love. Not only his love, but the love of our brothers and sisters. He brings us comfort in that. We have a fellow participation in the Spirit. We're all participating in this together. We are all working together along with the Spirit. You and I individually are participating together. We have affection and sympathy toward each other. We care. We love each other. We are compassionate toward each other. We don't want to see people suffer. We don't want to see people go through difficult times. And then he says, complete my joy. We have joy. That's not even on the board, but joy is a big thing. When Christians work together in the service of the Lord, it is a joyful thing. That should show on our faces, too. He says, be of the same mind. We need to be united in our, in our mind, in our thoughts, in our intentions, in our purpose, in our goals and our motivations, and in all the ways that we all agree on how to do what we do and what we do. All the hows and the whats, we need to be of the same mind about those things. We need to have the same love and be in full accord and of one mind. We need to agree together on the purpose of this church. We need to be of the same motivation, the same mind as the purpose of this church. That is why we do what we do, so that we can be in agreement, so that we can experience each other's love, so that we can experience the great comfort and encouragement that comes by being a part of Christ's body. You are Christ's body. And He is encouraging you, not only through His Word and in and of Himself as you pray to the Lord and ask Him for things, but He is encouraging you in your fellowship with your brothers and sisters. This is the why. And unless we start with the why then we are never going to be a church of committed, invested, loyal people. The why is something we don't talk about often enough, and that is to my shame, because I don't focus on the why enough. But unless we are committed to the why, then it's all going to fall apart, like the hired hand. How do we do that? Well, naturally, as we let these facts sink into our hearts, as we let these facts sink into our minds, it will, by its very nature, produce some very important things. Of course, we're going to cultivate stronger bonds with each other. Why? Because of that purpose we set out of being of the same mind. We want to be bonded together, and we're going to do the things that, that cultivate that. We're going to encourage weaker members. Why? Because who is the one who encourages us? Christ. And if Christ encourages me, then my job is to encourage you as somebody who may be going through difficult times. We need to be the kind of people who integrate newer members because it's not about us versus them. This is not an us versus them kind of congregation. That's not to say that every single person needs to know every single person, but the fact is you need to be open and willing to pull in new members when they come, integrate them into our group, why? Because of the purpose that we set out in verses 1 and 2 of Philippians chapter 2. We need to be the kind of people who welcome visitors. New visitors, frequent visitors, people who are with us. Be welcoming, be hospitable, be encouraging. Be the kind of people who let your passion, let your why show in what you do and how you do it. They should know that you care. And we need to fight. Not with each other. We need to fight for each other. We need to stand up for each other. As he says in verse 3, do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also the interests of others. Well, why would you do that in the first place? Because you're committed to the purpose. You're committed to the purpose of being of the same mind, showing love and fighting for each other. You see how this is working? You see how the passion and the purpose and the, the, 
the why question leads us to do the things that we do? Well, what does that look like? Well, that looks like worship. Oh, we're commanded to worship. And I could just stand up here today and I, say, I could say, well, you need to worship. Here's the five acts of worship, or the six acts of worship, or the fill-in-the-blank number of acts of worship. Do all these things. Check the box. Go home. But that's hollow, isn't it? That's going through the motions. And that's not what being led by purpose leads us to do. What being led, what being led by a purpose causes us to do in the what, in our worship, causes us to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth, from our heart all the way out to what we do, to what we believe, everything about us is worshiping God. And that is hopefully your goal today in being here. That's commanded. Now, the sticky part of this is there are plenty of things that we can do to accomplish this purpose, to accomplish this how, there are plenty of things we can do that aren't commanded in the Bible. I, I, I defy you to find the verse in the Bible that talks about work groups. And many people will stand up and they will say, you know what? It doesn't say anything about work groups here in the Bible. I'm out. Well, you're not being led by a purpose. You're not invested in the vision of this group. You don't see that in order for us to be unified together, in order for us to be encouraged, in order for us to show love, that is one of the ways that it looks like on the surface that we do that. And our elders are actively trying to find other ways to help encourage our members and build them up. And may God strengthen them in that work because we need these kinds of things. We need the service in whatever capacity of our deacons. We need the service of our teachers. We need the service of all of our members in mentoring and building each other up. We need to be visiting the shut-ins and the widows. We need to be going and, and participating in the times when we can sing together and encourage people at, at uh, nursing homes and various things. When we have small group Bible studies, when we have individual Bible studies, we, we need to be there, not because that's where we've started. Now, I could tell you, you need to go to a ladies' class. If I don't tell you why you need to go to a ladies' class or why that supports our greater vision here at Monta Vista, maybe you won't go. Maybe you won't get involved. And meeting from house to house. Back in Acts chapter 2, the purpose, the vision that Peter sets out, God is amazing. Jesus has died for us. He was the one prophesied, and you killed him. Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. And then what did they do as a result of that? They had a potluck. <laughs> Not out of the church funds. Individually, of course, and I have to put that asterisk on there because of all the denominational thinking today, but they didn't care about the denominational thinking of the day. It naturally led them to do what? Share their meals together from house to house. Be in each other's homes, love each other, encourage each other, and find every possible opportunity and excuse to be together. Why? Because they were committed to the vision. They were invested in the purpose. Casserole is not a four-letter word. We need to be the kinds of people who let our purpose, let our vision, let our reason for existing percolate down into how we do what we do and what we are as a result. Does this make sense? Am I lost anybody yet? Because if I have, you're not going to enjoy the second lesson. Trust me, it's all the same stuff. So as we think about these things, look at the book of Matthew in chapter 23. A very familiar verse. We're all, we're all well familiar with Jesus' scathing rebuke of the Pharisees. He called them a hired hand, and now he calls them hypocrites. You tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. What did they do? They were so focused on the what. They were so focused on the how. They forgot the weightier matters. They forgot the purpose. They forgot why they do these things in the first place. Justice, mercy, and faithfulness were... We're, should have been the core behind everything, but they forgot about it. 
He says, these you ought to have done without neglecting the others. And that, I hope, is what you'll understand is my message. I am not saying that tithing mint, mint and dill and cumin are bad. I'm not saying that being at worship is bad. I'm not saying that all the ways that we do what we do are bad. That's not the point. The point is you can't strain out the gnat and swallow the camel. You can't be so focused on the what and the how that you forget about the why. The why is the camel. And we need to... We need to investigate the camel. We need to investigate the why. We need to put the why into our heart. So I'm going to close this lesson with a challenge. Maybe this week, if you're inclined to, write down why you're a member at this place. Why are you a member here at Monta Vista? Why do you show up when you do? How does that purpose change you? How does, that, how does that why, how does your answer to the why question, how does that change you? And what steps are you willing to take to help this place to grow? Some foundational important questions that we all need to ask ourselves. Maybe sit and cogitate on the why for a while, and then let the what and the how come a little bit later. Please take out your songbooks and turn to the number that's been announced. If you're not a child of God, well, I could what and how you until I'm blue in the face. I could tell you all the steps. I could tell you all the results. I could give you everything you needed to know. I could, I could list it all out for you if you want me to. But what I know and what I understand, what I firmly believe, is unless you believe that Jesus Christ is exactly who he said he was, unless you truly believe that Jesus is the Son of God, which makes him Lord, which makes him the king, which makes him not just a king, but the king of your life. Unless you truly believe that, then no amount of what or how are going to convert you. Think about Jesus. Think about how much he loved you. Think about how much pain and agony and anguish it took him to go to that cross for you. Think about that and let it pierce your heart. And let it produce the how. And let it produce the what. If you're subject to the gospel call, please come as we stand and sing.